I'm Alan Belkin. Welcome to the first segment of the Applied Counterpoint course. In my previous video on Counterpoint, I talked about what Counterpoint is and why a composer needs it. Here I'm going to follow up on the third point I discussed in that video, how to learn Counterpoint. Here are the goals of our new course. I'll explain here how we're going to proceed. Our objectives are to provide a clear path to learning Counterpoint from beginner to advanced in a way that applies to real-life composition. Second, we explore the general musical principles governing counterpoint in ways that are not limited to any one style or even to tonal music in general. Third, to show the student how to approach every step along the way so as to get the most out of the work. A last goal is what differentiates this counterpoint course from many others. I call it No Rules Without Reasons. The most common problem in teaching and learning counterpoint is students not understanding the why for all the constraints. As mentioned in the previous video, there are two kinds of constraints. The first kind is practical, like the range of voices. These constraints apply all the time, regardless of what kind of music you're writing. The second kind is pedagogical. In the same way that a physical trainer works on a specific muscles with focused exercises, Species Counterpoint allows us to concentrate on one thing at a time. The first four species all have severe limits on rhythm and dissonance treatment, not because that's the way real-life music works, but simply to allow us to focus on specific problems. To ask a beginner to write beautiful, easily singable lines which combine well with other lines and which exhibit excellent control of harmonic tension and rhythmic momentum is just not realistic. So, Species Counterpoint allows us to work on each of these things individually. Then, in the fifth species, they start to come together. For the same reason, we start with two voice counterpoint and then move on to three and four voices. It's important to understand why we start with Volga counterpoint, specifically for untrained choral voices. Why? First of all, everybody has a voice. Singing is a cultural universal. Second, instruments are often called upon to imitate voices. Conductors often tell their players in the orchestra to make their instruments sing. Third, untrained voices show us the difference between what's easy to sing and what's harder. And that's a difference that's important for a composer to know. Now let's talk specifically on how to work on your counterpoint. One thing these lessons can't give you is practice. If you want to come friends with the notes, you have to spend lots of time with them. If you do two examples of each species, you won't get fluent. You need to do at least 10 examples of each, and more is better. Second, it's really useful sometimes to do more than one version of the same exercise. The first one might come easily, but when you're struggling to do the third version, it'll force you to explore things you didn't think of up to then. And last, but not least, active learning is better than passive learning. Doing exercises on your computer is fine and good, but you'll learn much more if you sing and play them yourself. The best way to do this is to play one line on the piano while you sing the other one and then flip. If you can't play the piano, at least have the computer play one line while you sing the other one. You'll discover things as you sing the lines yourself that no amount of passive listening will ever reveal. This method takes a lot more time, but you'll also get, get much more out of it. Now we're ready to get started. The next segment will discuss writing vocal melodies.